Hello and welcome to today's episode of Rockwood Live. I'm your host, Rockwood. Today we're taking a look at Telepresence, a tool for helping Kubernetes development, which has been notoriously difficult over the years. Now, before we get started, I just want to start with a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, first, if you've not subscribed to the YouTube channel, shame on you. Please do that now uh, and click the bell so that you get notifications for all future episodes. Also, if you like to chat, talk cloud native and Kubernetes, there is a Discord server where you can come and join. We are around 400 people now talking about all things tech all the time. Really good fun. Come and say hello. And of course, lastly, I want to thank Equinix Metal. Uh, they are my employer, but they also allow me to produce this show on their time, helping us all learn cloud native together. So thank you, Equinix Metal. Um, you can use the code raw code. This will get you 200 hours of credits to test on our platform. That's roughly 400 hours of compute if you use a modest instance, but you're going to have much more fun using it with the bigger instances. So, you know, use it as you wish. And today we're taking a look at telepresence. Sorry, I cut a comment out of the corner of my eye. I'll answer that in a minute, Noel. Uh, today I'm joined by Daniel and Peter. Uh, hello. <laughs> hello, everyone. Hey, David. Yeah. Sorry, I, I don't often get caught by comments, but it just popped right up and it was just Noel asking, <laughs> do I have new headphones? Uh, very <laughs> good thing to notice. Yes, I do. Um, my wife was moaning at me because my last headphones were noise cancelling and I would talk too loud. So these are open ears so that I can maintain my volume. Anyway, Brilliant. <laughs> random segue. Uh, so thank you for joining me uh, today, Daniel and Peter. Do you just want to just take a little bit of time and tell us who you are, what you do? Uh, we'll start with you, Daniel, there. Yeah, hi everyone. Thanks for the intro, uh, David. Thanks for inviting us along. So my name is Daniel Bryant, Director of DevRel at Ambassador Labs. My background actually started in academia, but then moved into Java development. I say my native language is Java, um, then a whole bunch of JavaScript and other things along the way. Um, reluctant operator is what I like to say to myself, right? I was always the build person. Like I, I naturally gravitated towards Hudson and then Jenkins as it changed, and then kind of just followed that through my consulting career in London, doing a lot of work with Mesos. And then of course, when Kubernetes came on, like initially betting on Mesos, and then suddenly I realized, hang on, Kubernetes is where it's at, right? Uh, and then I got friendly with the Master Labs folks, uh, or DataWire as we were called back then. And Telepresence, the fir first version of it, um, was just popping up. And, and for me, it solved a real problem. And that's actually when I joined the company. I was like, this Telepresence tool and then the Ambassador API Gateway, super useful for what I'm doing. You know, I like these people, I should work with them. <laughs> and that's what I did. <laughs> Peter, nice. over to you. Cool, thanks, Daniel. Uh, yeah, so Peter O'Neill, uh, developer advocate at Ambassador Labs. Uh, kind of got my start in network engineering, moved more into de DevOps space, did a little bit more coding stuff. Uh, came across DevRel about a year ago, uh, and then moved over to Ambassador Labs about six months ago, where I've kind of been uh, leading the charge on on talking about telepresence and teaching telepresence, kind of like getting it into the hands of as many people as possible. Uh, and so, yeah, so I've been having a great time, kind of kind of playing with the tech. Uh, so great to be here, David. Mm -hmm. Awesome. We have a Java developer and a network engineer. Awesome. <laughs> so nice it's like to, a, nice a joke, to, right? It's like, well, yeah, it definitely could be. Walked cool. into a bar. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm not going to try and make up a joke. I'm not that smart. <laughs> right. uh, how is Java in the cloud native landscape these days? Is it better? Because it, it used to be quite a challenge. Yeah, I mean, funny for Richard, like uh, our boss uh, and I were just talking about this later on today. Um, you know, the advent of Spring Boot in particular changed a lot of stuff. So, hats it to the Spring community, the the Java community, and everyone sort of picked up from them. There's Micro Profile, there's Quarkus from the Red Hat team. There's lots of interesting web frameworks in the space now that have baked in cloud libraries, cloud primitives. So, I'm playing around like on my free time quite a bit with Quarkus. It's super interesting. You can nice. do native builds, for example. Um, so like a lot of problems you have with the big JVM of kind of, you know, you can address them now and run small footprint stuff. That's awesome. Yeah, I was always really excited uh, by GraalVM. I thought that was really exciting. Oh, that's it, yes. Um, yeah, and Scala, I think they just, last week they released version three of that language and I always really liked writing Scala, but running the JVM and containers just got really cumbersome. So maybe that's yeah. something I could start experiment with, experimenting with more now. That's cool. Hmm. Right, there, that's our segue done. Let's get let's get back on track. <laughs> We're going to talk telepresence today. So um, I believe, Daniel, you're going to give us a little bit of a quick introduction, and then we're going to get straight into our hands-on section. Yeah, sure thing. Let me just set us up here with the share screen. There you go. You're up. Looking good. 
So I'm sure anyone who's a coder will recognize this. You get the inner and outer dev loops. Now, I've got a massive hat tip to Mitch Denny, where I got the initial idea from. And unfortunately, the, the blog post has disappeared now. It's a 404. So I've managed to find the graphic from someone else who um, saw this as well. But you'll recognize that if you're doing TDD, you get that inner loop, right? You come up with a test, you write some code, you verify it, and you go, go around and, and you know, you're often working locally here. Even if you're not doing TDD, you come up with an idea, you code some stuff, you, you know, put your print line in, you see what's going on. When you're happy, then you go to the outer loop. You typically you know, commit to Git, commit to you know, version control, you might run some integrations, some testing, and then you release ultimately and, and so forth. Now, the challenge we've seen, oh, I'm challenging seen with Kubernetes, is once you get to a certain point, you know, you, the inner and outer loop are quite similar. You're writing code, then you're building a container, you're pushing to registry, deploying to cluster, just to test, and this can be quite slow. You know, you want to stay local as long as you can, and you want to mock things, but of course, when you're running, like, say, mocks, stubs, doubles, there's a whole bunch of uh, assumptions in there, right? So sometimes you just, you're in that small little inner loop, but you really want to test what you're doing against some dependency. Um, and you really want to avoid that, Docker build, let alone the Docker push, like to a remote registry, right? And it's something that Peter and I play around with a lot is you actually want to be using your own tools locally. So you, you know, as much as you might have some services running on a remote Kubernetes cluster, some you know locally, you want to be connecting them all up, but using the local tools. You know, I'm sure many of us know about remote debugging. You can open up ports and you know Kubernetes cluster or just their VM in general. But you know, swapping between local, then remote, local and remote, it's all a bit of a hassle. So when you're starting out, a lot of folks do just code literally everything locally, right? Pick your poison, Docker, Minikube, Rancher, MicroKits, K3S. But and this comes very much from my Java days. Once you get past a certain number of services, your laptop, even you know, even a nice Mac 16 inch <laughs> here, will not keep up, right? Like you, you just you get to that point where you have to expand into a remote cluster. You know, you cannot run all your services uh, locally. And that's where telepresence really helps. A bunch of different sort of phrases I've heard around telepresence. It's fancy Kubernetes VPN for development. It's something I hear quite a bit. Kubectl port forward on steroids. I hear that one quite a bit. And if anyone knows that Kubectl port forward, like the syntax, I always have to Google it because it's quite tricky to remember, right? And, and you're doing one pod at a time, um, whereas telepresence kind of makes that much, much easier. So that's why they're the on steroids. Um, but fundamentally, it's a network bridge between your laptop and the Kubernetes cluster. So I mentioned a few times there that kind of scenario where you've got local services and remote services. Telepresence is that bridge. So we can do stuff locally without Docker build, without Docker push. Um, we can use our IDE, use our tools locally as if we were in the cluster. The local services we've got running are bridged effectively in terms of network namespace with the remote cluster. And if this seems a bit sort of hand wavy at the moment, the demo that David is going to look through and, and Peter should make this all super clear. Telepresence is one of those tools and you see it, you're like, oh yeah, totally get it. You try it and then often you really like, how do I do development without it? You'll often think, right? Yeah. So that's the kind of setup I wanted to do, if that's all right, sir. Perfect. David, stop sharing. All right, thank you for that. So let's ask you the, the, the difficult question, easy question. Oh, we'll see. Uh, like the, the picture with the laptop on fire, right? I think this is a problem that is now ubiquitous when I speak to people that are trying to work out how to get their development workflow working in a Kubernetes environment. And there's a certain pain threshold, if you will, that at X number of services, it just doesn't become physically possible anymore to run all of that stuff locally. You do need to revert back to like the shared dev server of 19, whatever, 90. Um, yeah. So if we invert that a little bit, does it make sense and would you encourage that everybody starts to look at telepresence now regardless of the number of services with that pain threat with that pain point there or do you think that there's a certain point where then you start to look at telepresence like does that make sense it does peter do you want to have a go at that one <laughs> oliver oliver think yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah definitely and so so what it really comes down to is building out a consistent development workflow, right? And so, so if you are a team of one, it, it may seem like a bit of overkill because you're like, oh, I can do all this stuff now. But it's, so then when you change the process later, th then you have that, 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 that change tax where all of a sudden it's like, oh, now you're trying to introduce something new. So 
if you can actually introduce telepresence when it is only one service and one person, right? And then you add two or three more people onto the team, all of a sudden now you have this process that scales very well as the team grows with you. So, yeah. so, so yes, like it, it, you can adopt it very early and, and, but I think it scales very well if you do. Awesome. That's exactly the answer I was hoping to hear. Cause I think that you building these really good development practices early is really important. And I'll go back mm -hmm. to something Daniel said in the slides as well, is that doubles and mocking are never really good enough. Right. And especially if you're yeah. using cloud, you know, provided services like S3 or RDS, et cetera. You know, we do have tools like local stack that try to provide enough of an API mm -hmm. that your application is going to work, but why not just use those actual services and actually have guarantees in the way that it's going to work? And I think those approaches um, definitely work better for most situations. I would add this great point, Dan. I would add, like, I've got a hat tip always on, on every uh, chat, really. Cindy Shridharan's work, Copy mm -hmm. Construct. I'm sure you bumped into her fantastic writings. And she talks a lot about fidelity, right? It's the amount of fidelity you want. Like, there's the testing against, like, mocks, which gives you, you know, it's quick, but it gives you limited confidence. Then you can fire up, say, local stack. It gives you a bit more confidence because it's, you know, an emulation of those uh, data stores. But then if you actually push into, like, the, the real thing, well, the fidelity is super high there, right? But it can be typically a bit slower. So I think for me, it's like, let's see if anyone hasn't read Cindy's work. So, you know, after the stream, Google Copy Construct. She's on Twitter. She's on Medium. Like some fantastic blog posts that talk about the trade offs around fidelity when testing. Yeah. And generally, just all around awesome writing on distributed systems, yeah. I find. Just go read everything on the blog. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> All right. Well, awesome. Um, I'm really excited to start playing with telepresence. So let's get my screen shared and we're going to start from nothing. And we're going to see how we can start to use this for a development workflow. Uh, so let's see, we have three floating heads. I have the telepresence documentation and I have a terminal. That's all I need, right? We happy? Looks good. Looks good. <laughs> Looks good to me. Yep. All right. Awesome. So, Let's see. I'm assuming I'm going to have to just install the telepresence binary to my machine. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah, you could go all in whole, on the whole block if you want. Yeah. Yeah, well, you could go all in on the quick start, David, and it literally downloads and does everything for you. Depends how manual you want to go. Oh, I skipped the page. Did yeah, I? if you go new to Kubernetes on the left there, like it will literally provision your cluster up in our cloud um, and also give you a package to download and it will then download um, telepresence and everything for you. Okay, so let's see. Sign in to Ambassador Cloud, let's do that. Did you want to give us the the pitch on Ambassador Cloud? Will I just quickly sign up? Yeah, sure thing. So yeah, so then, like... Well, go for it, go for it, Peter, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so, so I say Ambassador Cloud is, is is something that we've relatively recently added and it connects our open source tools under kind of one umbrella and allows you to 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 have like one central place for like telepresence. We have the idea of what is an intercept, which which does the connection. And so Ambassador Cloud can hold those for you. And like you can see a list of not just yours, but if you are associated with the team, you can see intercepts for for the rest of your team as well. And then that allows you to share and collaborate very easily. Okay, so it has downloaded something. <laughs> you have to unzip it, uh, David. You should be good to go. All right, I have a cube config and an install file. I was going to be very trusting there, but you know, maybe I'll just peek at it at least. <laughs> uh, no I mean, I would, to, uh, yeah, I've got a right. curl that <laughs> piped at the bash just fine, but the fact that I've downloaded it, no, I've got to be careful. All right. Uh, I like the way you completely skipped over the readme as well. Love it. <laughs> well, uh, readmes? What? What are those? Uh, okay, so several dependencies. Oh, okay. Just doing something. Um. So should I have read the readme? Was that? Was I being very yeah, naive? It's up to you. Peter and I spent like hours crafting the perfect readme. We're not, not offended <laughs> though, right? All right. Okay. Let's read it. <laughs> Actually, the hat to the team. I don't think it was us that wrote it, that wrote it Peter, was it? I don't think so. I think, I think we might have commented on it though. Yeah. <laughs> it's our amazing engineering team that have done a lot of the, uh, the heavy lifting here. 
Yeah, well, I always really appreciate it when companies provide these kind of just one push button deploys to give me something to actually play with it, test with it with. So it's really cool and that I was able to do that. And I didn't have to enter a credit card, which is always a major plus one. So um, yeah. we've installed, this is telling me and I have access to telepresence. We have some demo applications. It looks like we've got something in Node. Uh, we've got something in Flask slash Python. Fast API, is that Python too? Is that something else? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, Java and Go. Where's the Rust? Where's the Rust love? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and I can reuse the install to trigger any of these. Okay, nice. Uh, let's just make sure I have the telepresence CLA. So that was nice and easy to get started. Now, I just jump back over to here. And okay, so now let's test that cube control. <laughs> uh, the chat people know me so well. No rust, Rockwood will be sad. <laughs> Thanks, Nuno. Uh, okay. Know so, your audience. Good stuff. Yeah. Uh, let's export our cube config. What was it called? YAML. Oh, yeah. I already had one here locally. It's not going to be an awkward. But at least it would get. And run. Let's see. Oh, looks good. So the I just want to make sure I get this right. This is provided to me via Ambassador Cloud. It is just a Kubernetes API. I don't know. If, oh, yeah, KCS, I can see it there in a the version. Um, hmm. And this is just mine. I can use this. Does this disappear? Does it run for a certain amount of time? Can you maybe help me understand the magic a little bit? Yeah, with the so, so with the with the quick start, this spins up a, a kind of your access to one of our demo clusters. And the demo cluster, we I think we, we've changed the lifespan of them a couple of times, but right now I believe it lasts a couple of days. I have to, I, I don't remember exactly, but, but like I think you have a couple of days of, of uh, where you can log in and use it, but then once it disappears, you can just start it up again and get a, get a brand new demo cluster. So is this mm -hmm. namespace exclusive to me or am I sharing this with anyone else who just happened to kind of be using it at the same time? No, no, I, the whole cluster should be yours. Like it's right, one okay. virtual Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so that whole thing is yours. Awesome, cool. And we do watch for bit more coin mining. If anyone's thinking of uh, jumping in, right? <laughs> like... <laughs> uh, I wasn't going to make that joke. It did cross my mind. I thought, no, let's not put people ideas in people's heads because these <laughs> they don't need any more. Um, but, all right, you were straight in there. Um, I don't know. Were you susceptible to any of the pull request spam over the last few months with crypto miners and open source projects? I know that we got hit by it a fair bit on Tinkerbell and oh, other wow. projects. But, like you know, no, I had you... Circle CI and 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 for, like GitHub, for example, right? Uh, sort of you know big name casualties there, but no, we do monitor our, our sort of stack pretty, pretty aggressively. Yeah, that's perfectly understandable. All right. Okay. We ran get services. I can see these are running. So we've got our Kubernetes one, which is just the API. We've got some other services running. Uh, so it's now asking me to run a telepresence status. Mm -hmm. That raises questions. So. Is telepresence using my cube control context to understand if I already have something running or am I making too many guesses? Yes. So, yes. so <laughs> with that, te te telepresence has two parts, right? Because telepresence is, is bridging your local laptop with your remote cluster, right? And it's creating what is kind of like a VPN, but it's more so bridging your local network with that remote network. So there's two two pieces, like one on each end, right? You have your telepresence uh, binary locally on your machine, which runs that local daemon. And then you have the, what is called a traffic manager running in the cluster. And those are the two pieces that create the bridge that allows you to access the network resources in the cluster. Okay, so these ambassador pods, are these what are fulfilling that duty? No. no, I think it's not running yet. Once you oh, actually, right. when the next steps, when we actually connect, Telepresence is going to do a scan for for those services. And when it doesn't see them, it will spin them up. Right. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> and so uh, here, we, here we, we are asking for the password because, uh, because we are starting that local daemon. That is a suited process. Yeah. I've made so many mistakes typing my password in that I'm just going to remove it <laughs> off screen. Uh, Open up your notepad with all your passwords and be okay, here we go. 
<laughs> I don't know. It happened to me like it was with Alex Ellis. I don't know if you're familiar, but we we did a stream together like four months ago or something, and the actual shell or the pseudo process seg file sheet, which I've never seen before ever. <laughs> As I was halfway through typing my password, and it just was all on the oh, screen. No. <laughs> so, so now I'm just always that little bit extra careful. Even though it's just my laptop password, I, I still I'll, oh. I'll take precautions. Okay. Uh, I'm really glad I ran Get Pods All before, just out of sheer luck, yeah, I right guess. Now. And now right we've now. ran Telepresence Connect. So what I suggest, or what I think, is we're going to see nothing different. <laughs> oh no. Do we? Yeah. The very Traffic last manager. one. The very last one. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I missed that. Mm. Okay. So that's he's running the traffic manager, inner cluster. I'm assuming, I'm sure I could read the docs and it's going to tell me what to do, but I like to assume. Uh, yeah. There we go. We now have bits connected stuff to do, even though I, I don't know what that stuff is yet. Awesome. So. Ah, huh, that's interesting. The magic <laughs> just keeps coming. So I can, <laughs> I can just curl and hit my cluster. Yeah. So 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 this is this is the networking that I was uh, previously speaking about. Where now your local laptop has a direct network connection into your cluster. So your DNS resolution in the cluster is now available on your local machine, and that Kubernetes service in the default namespace. It's now reachable through the Kubernetes API. Mm -hmm. Fancy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I've got a, a few, maybe two questions. So, if I am switching Cube Control context regularly, will that be a problem for telepresence? So, so right now, telepresence, uh, it. it if you start it up and you switch context, it will it will error out because it'll say, oh, context has changed. And remember, the telepresence binary on your machine is essentially creating a tunnel to one cluster. Uh, so right now, that is that is a limitation where you'd want to quit uh, out of one connection before you started up a new connection with another cluster. Uh, okay. But it, but it is something that we are aware of, uh, and because I feel like. No one has just one cluster nowadays, right? So, so, so it is something that that, that, that we, we we have a we have a note to to see if we can make that switching a little more seamless. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So, is there uh, like did I run telepresence disconnect when I was changing cluster? Is that a command? I... Uh, we have we have telepresence quit, quit. Uh, or telepresence uninstall, which will actually remove the the will, will tear down the the pieces that create the connection. Okay. Mm -hmm. Telepresence quit says it's something I would type after I've got my unit test failing and I'm giving up for the day. So maybe maybe <laughs> I think I'll enjoy that after a bit more time. Okay, so that's I mean, right off the bat, that's just interesting. Um querying the an actual service within my cluster locally. That's pretty cool. I really like that. That is a wow straight away, David, right? In terms of like <laughs> it's even more impressive when like you're uh, hitting a like I say an application, which we'll do in a minute, I think, and then they're getting started, right? But I remember when I first first up and around, I was, this is kind of cool, right? Before I'd have to look for the pod name, do a cool couple port forward, hit that, you know, all that kind of thing. And where's this? Like one command, now you're sharing the namespace. Yeah, because the fact that it's working with my actual host networking through some mysterious way. Um, yeah. um, we can ask questions about that, but I probably wouldn't understand it, but maybe we can talk about it. But I mean, there are now no limitations on the way that I work or develop my application locally. If I just, if I don't want to use containers or Kubernetes at all, I mean, I could just do go build and go run and it can speak to Kubernetes services, right? I mean, that's, yeah, that's, exactly. that's pretty special. Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's not <laughs> something that we're used to in developing against remote APIs. And I, re I really like that. That's, that's nice. I mean, and now though, you completely overshadowed the fact that you've given me a dev environment for pseudo free for testing as well. That's, that's now <laughs> no longer important. What's important is the network magic. So, uh, I mean, how confident are we talking about the networking stuff? Can we dig into that a little bit? <laughs> I'm curious, like, is it a root in my routing table? Is it DNS resolution is it intercepting all my traffic. Like if I open up Twitter.com, is it going to go through telepresence first? Like, can we maybe just shed a little bit more light on that if we can? 
Yeah, definitely. So, so now that you've established that connection and the tunnel has been created, what the telepresence, uh, uh, the local telepresence binary, what it's doing is it's it's adding in the DNS resolution for the Kubernetes objects before your normal resolution. So it's looking for oh, he uh, the, the user typed in dot default or they typed okay. in dot namespace a right, and so those things will try to get resolved first against the cluster. And if it doesn't see that, then it will default back to your normal network. And so the other thing, the other thing that telepresence does on that connect is it it builds a it builds an IP tables uh, uh, kind of construct and just says oh this is what's available to me. Uh, and I think I think we'll get to it eventually. But there's a if you run telepresence list, it'll say everything that it sees in the current namespace. And so those all get created on the telepresence connect, which makes it very quick once you actually want to want to curl that service or access that service. All of those IP table routes are are created up front. Ah, mm -hmm. very cool. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, let's get back to the actual docs. I'll, I'll stop driving us down little rabbit holes here. But <laughs> uh, yeah, we can run. Get pause. The networking super interesting, though, right? Yeah, I mean, coming from the network engineering background, and then <laughs> yeah, like, like once I touched Kubernetes, I was like, wow, there's a lot of networking in Kubernetes. <laughs> yeah, it definitely is. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's really cool. So DNS plus IP tables all mixed and mashed together to give us exactly what we need from the, the cluster. Uh, okay, I've lost my place. Right. Kubernetes we did, get pods we ran. Well, so now I can just browse to our very large Java service. And there it is. Educorp, I like it. <laughs> Edgy's our mascot, David. I don't know if you've seen our little blackbird on like, Ambassador and Telepresence. Oh, is that branding. his name? Edgy. Edgy. Edgy the, yeah, Edgy the blackbird. All right. Oh, yeah, nice. I feel like we, we, we need to update this and really get a picture of Edgy just on the, on that on that page. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> totally video, right? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Front and center somewhere here. Like, hi, I'm Edgy. Welcome to my company. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, I'll get over the magic of the networking. Let's, let's do something. So we've got an NPM application here. Um, that we can spin into and run. It is worth doing, David. Just on um, instruction number three above, just like nothing under the sleeves, right? Um, you should see the EdgeCore website with a green title and green pod because we're going to change some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Ah, right. Okay. Okay. Just ah, so, so everyone I'm watching along as well, it's, it's green. Yeah. Okay. So the uh, node application that we're potentially going to change, you're, you're going to ask me to change the CSS or something to change the colors of this. Is that where we're going? Okay. Yep. All right, so that's CD, and I need to just npm start. So I don't need to do an install first. Are we shipping node modules here? Yeah. Okay. So we've got a local process running on port three thousand. Should I browse to that? Oh yeah. There we go. He always wants all ahead. the answers, and I just keep throwing out <laughs> questions anyway. Like, okay, so we've got something here where the color is blue. Yep. Uh, and now we're going to use a telepresence interceptor to. I won't guess. I'm gonna. I'm gonna delegate that to someone here, <laughs> Pierre. <laughs> Yeah, so, so 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 now we're at the part where we're actually intercepting traffic, right? And so for if anyone if anyone listening uh, used telepresence one, we used to call this swap deployment, where there, there, we actually kind of swap the deployments out, and now we call it an intercept because it is much more of a routing rule where we are intercepting traffic uh, destined for a service in this case, data processing service. Right, and we're intercepting that traffic. It's hitting that traffic manager in the remote cluster, going to a sidecar, and then being routed down into your local telepresence uh, binary, where it can hit your local service. And so, and then from there, right, telepresence also gives you access to to the Kubernetes API. So, if your local service is reaching out to any database connections or other services, right, then you can it gets passed right back through. And so that intercept is kind of handled seamlessly as it connects your local laptop into the rest of the cluster. Sweet. Mm. All right, so before I run that, let's tackle a, a question we got on the chat then. And Naveen is asking, does every developer get their own demo cluster or a shared one? Um, 
I think based on our conversation, what we said is that we each get our own virtualized Kubernetes cluster, but can we just confirm that, I guess? So, Sounds so, good. Uh, <laughs> but there is a limited yeah, number. So, That's the only thing. Yeah, and I think actually, if you're on a shared team, you you actually end up getting added to the same cluster. If you add with your personal GitHub account, oh, you'd have mm. your own demo cluster. Um, so I think that's it. But, but once you actually start using Telepresence, you're going to be using it with your own cluster. And whether you want to share or not, that's completely up to you. <laughs> yeah, when I signed up, it did ask me which of my teams I wanted to use for, for this. And I just selected my own personal account. So I guess if I had selected Equinix, then anyone else at Equinix is selected Equinix, we'd probably get in the same one. So cool. Mm -hmm. Right, and if there's a lot of folks jumping in, we might see like we, we don't have a camera. We we run now, but I know like a few times if there's lots of people like on a on a live stream on a demo, like there is a limited the finite number of the um the free uh, clusters. Though you can totally spin up Docker Desktop or something else uh, or GKE. I've often used um it won't stop you and um, playing around with the demo, but you might have to come back tomorrow and try again if you did want to use our one. Yeah, great points. I'm assuming like because we downloaded that kubeconfig as part of the registration part with a master cloud but if i was using my regular kubeconfig when i run telepresence connect it would just have set up that traffic manager on my own cluster like so completely irrelevant yeah. that my cluster yeah. came from this place right now well except yeah. for the example services of course yes yeah all right uh and then we got a comment from lewis who just thinks he's being funny uh, Spelling color the UK. <laughs> nice. I, I have this conversation with Daniel all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think I've just worked for so many US companies now that I've just given up Same. and I've, I now Same. just type everything in US English. It's just, it's, it's just <laughs> easier. Okay, let's intercept some traffic then. So let's just jump into here. Uh, why is that red? Oh. The paths. So when I ran the install script. Ah, uh, yeah, it set the path to your uh, that current directory. Oh, uh, is the binary just here? Yeah. Oh, like I'm guessing. Uh, there we go. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, there we go. Uh, so now we're setting up an intercept for a data processing service on 3000. You're slightly off the bottom of my screen there, Dave. I don't know if that's. Yep, I do that every day. <laughs> it's because I use a, like a Thailand window manager on Mac that automatically it sets the size of my windows and I keep forgetting that the bottom of my console is not visible. <laughs> nice. Well, thanks for mentioning that. Otherwise it would have taken me like 40 minutes if I remembered. <laughs> All right, so our intercept was created. We're not doing any SSHFS. We can talk about that, I guess, in a minute. Um, mm -hmm. But now if I curl on 12700-3000, oh no, that's the destination, okay. Is this telling me that there is something and the traffic manager of my cluster is now redirecting traffic to the data processing service to my local machine. Is is that correct? Yeah. So 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 what would go to the data processing service uh, uh, in your remote cluster is now being forwarded to that that local address of one two seven zero zero on port three thousand because we specified that port flag at the top. And so if you're obviously using a different different service, you can specify whichever port is running uh, locally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what about, I'm trying to think now, like, you know, say we've got a large Kubernetes cluster or their dev team or, you know, maybe six people and we both want to intercept a service at the same time. Is that something that's possible or is that a conflict? So, so there's the difference between uh, uh, authenticated intercepts and unauthenticated in intercepts. And so when you ran, if you, or if you run telepresence status one more time, you're going to see that you are logged out right now. And, and so we, we could show this again at the end, but essentially, right, that gets down into the, the difference between team collaboration and solo collaboration. If you want to authenticate to Ambassador Cloud uh, and connect to your team, that's when you have those team features. And so that's when you can do uh, more specialized intercepts and do things like separation on header-based routing and, and, and wow. more collaborative tools. Uh, but right now, this intercept, because you're unauthenticated, is just sending all traffic down to your local machine. It's not. It's not separating anything. Awesome, cool. So I'm assuming the docs are going to tell me to refresh EduCorp in a minute. <laughs> oh no, we have to make a code change first, right? <laughs> no, no, no. I think I think it's that step two. You might have skipped over it. So after that intercept, oh, yeah. yeah. 
There we go. We went from green to blue. Mm. And now it's telling me to make a change to make it orange. So. Uh, all right, let's see. Data processing app.js. Uh, well, that's annoying. Uh, let's just close it. Uh, da, 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 Educarp data processing that. So this would just be me as a developer working on my microservice locally, making changes as we go. And these are just going to be updated in real time. Yep. So if we switch back there, we'll see that node picked up the change, restarted the service, and and now we can refresh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think this is the kind of feedback loop that everyone working against Kubernetes wants. And I don't really feel that mm -hmm. we've ever really been there yet, but this magic -y stuff, <laughs> doing things that I don't understand is very cool. So. Just to paint the picture again, David, for folks like um, uh, watching on the stream. So we're now like going into the very large Java service. It is calling out to the data processing service, which is on your local machine, which your local machine is reaching into the cluster again to the very large data store, getting some data. It's coming back. Data processing service is returning that to the very large Java service. The very large Java service is building its web page. It's like a Spring app. So it's kind of cool. As in, we've got like requests coming in through like a you know a front end microservice, if you like, maybe the monolith. It's calling out to your laptop. You're doing your thing with telepresence, but you can still call in. So you've got that complete chain there going on, which I think is like it's not always always at first glance, but it's like hang on, we're testing it like the user would see, and we're calling into the cluster, accessing services that are not running on my machine. When I first saw that, I was like, whoa, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool, right? Yeah, that is definitely very cool. I mean, that means I could be on the call with a very unhappy client who's telling me to change the colors of something and just actually do it. Yeah, exactly. Time. That's <laughs> the inspiration for the demo. <laughs> <laughs> totally. I've been there. Yeah. Especially with remote work. No, your margin's not right. One more pixel. No, two more pixels. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> CSS, right? Oh, I, I, I really should be better at CSS. It's one of those things I keep... I keep thinking I should be better at and then every time I look at it, I'm like, no, not for me. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to try not to skip any more stuff here and have you have to correct me. But I think we've done this bit here. We've made a code change. We've seen yep. our NPM service restart locally and all the traffic within the cluster is now seeing our new value. Very cool. Now we can do a telepresence leave on this service, which I'm assuming just means that the traffic will no longer be routed to my machine. Yeah, so it's just going to tear down that intercept that we created and and disconnect the 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 tunnel for that. The overall tunnel will still be up, but the connection for for that intercept will be down. Okay, and now it wants me to do a login and then do an intercept again. Okay, that passing is fun for me. <laughs> That's a good bit of feedback for us, David, actually, on that one. I think it's just because I switched terminal. I made it more complicated for myself rather than anything else. Um, <laughs> oh, so we also get a nice UI view as well then from the, the cloud interface. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Peter was mentioning earlier, we call this our service catalog. So we use annotations. So you just add annotations to your Kubernetes services. If you actually, David, you pop that to the cluster, you can do a K or kubectl describe service data processing service um, and you'll see the annotations which we're using the aatr.io standard data processing. Uh, data processing service yeah in addition to all the things you usually see uh there uh oh, my inability to type <laughs> i might have got the uh, oh different context oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> of course <laughs> Be, as the, again, me splitting my terminals gets me into <laughs> If you scroll up a little bit, see there, aatr.io, folks can pop along to aatr.io and see we've got a bunch of sort of standardized uh, annotations and you can add in, you know, links to um, Slack, links to GitHub repos. And when you pop back to the service catalog, we'll pass those annotations into the metadata you see in the service catalog. 
Yeah, that's very cool. It's one of those things that you don't really realize is a problem until your team is dealing with dozens to hundreds of microservices. One of them's causing 100%. problems. You need to be able to, oh, well, there's my dog. <laughs> you have to be able to reach out to them and work out, oh, well, who do I even need to speak to first? I didn't realize. That's exactly the use case. So yeah, we, we've like, we've chatted a lot of customers and they are like, when an instant, you know, page duty fires off 3 a.m., even being able to see who owns the service and where the repo is, is like, gold yeah so and and then you you know you don't have to use master cloud you can just put the atr.io annotations there and you know 80 percent of the value but if you want that nice ui onto it and you can drill into the services and explore around there master cloud gives you that one the community license free for as many services as you like for the uh, annotations ah nice well it looks like one of our audience viewers just ran into some trouble by deleting everything on their cluster <laughs> oh no <laughs> uh unlucky no uh, I'm only taking partial blame for you working while watching this, but still. <laughs> okay, so I like the service catalog. Um, a lot of value there. And let's see what's next. So we've done the login. We've seen the service catalog and we're going to run the intercept again. So what is different from running the intercept as an unauthenticated user versus running it as an authenticated user? Is this where the team right. functionality comes in? Yes, and so now, now once you run this, it's going to prompt you for a lot more information because now, because it, it's running in that kind of collaborative intercept mode, it wants to know, okay, uh, we're going to create this thing called a preview URL, which is going to show you uh, your application uh, while using this intercept and only this intercept. So, so now this is a specialized view. Uh, and so we're not going to be using... We're going to be using the the very large Java service dot default namespace for this one, uh, and so so this way, right? This preview URL is only going to show what this application looks like while using your intercept, and you can share that with anyone while the main ingress is unaffected. I mean, that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what should I be typing here for our ingress IP address? Is that going to be this the... is the service that? Yeah, this is the service that we want to uh, render when we go to this preview URL. So we want to see that uh, uh, the the orange EduCorp app. Uh, so we're using the very large Java service in the default namespace. Right. And port we're going to be using 8080, I believe. <laughs> Should I be looking at the docs and you're just sitting there telling me? It's looking pretty good so far. I'm like, you know, I'm always going to remember as well. TLS, no, yeah. All right, no. Uh, I won't ask you anymore. I'll just, I'll read the documentation <laughs> like I could say. <laughs> uh, okay, so now I think we're just hitting return here, right? That's. Yep. Okay, we're just using the default. Okay. See, and this is this is interesting because we're intercepting on the data processing service, but we're rendering the very large Java service for our preview, and so it's showing it's showing that connection flow of like this is what your application is going to look like from the front end, even though we've changed one of the middle services uh, uh, further down the stack. Okay, so is this is this stalling because it's it's now doing the thing? Like I should just leave that and and move on, right? Okay, I won't wait for that to finish. I just want to make sure I know what's going on on this side. So we're not intercepting our NPM one anymore. Does this mean this is going to be green again? Or are Correct. we still intercepting? So, no, we, no, we left, right? So we did a, a telepresence leave. We left the intercept. So this should revert back to the default view uh, that, that it was before we did anything. And then once that preview URL is created, right? And so, so that takes a, a, a little bit of time because that's reaching out to the ambassador cloud and it's creating... Uh, that network connection, and it's also creating uh, the, the the DNS for the preview URL. So it takes a little bit of time for all those pieces to to kind of come together. And so here here we can see that that has popped up now. The second to last line there is our our new preview URL. Edgestack.me. <laughs> okay. Right, and so now this is rendering that orange view that you created earlier. What? <laughs> <laughs> so you're so, hitting the same front-end Java service, 
But because the preview URL injects a header and we pass that header down through, Telepresence is smart enough to say, when the header is present on the preview URL, show me the local stuff, route to the local. And when there's no header present, pass me through. Right. Okay. So we actually, okay. There was a disconnect in my head there, but we ran the same intercept command we did previously. But because we were authenticated this time, it's allowing us to have an actual ingress preview environment that does some sort of traffic shaping so that only I am seeing the orange one. Okay. But if I refresh here, we still get the green one. Okay. It clicked. I got there. <laughs> nice. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. So that's, I'm, I'm assuming anyone watching this episode can just browse to that URL now and they're going to see the orange one. That's, that's now mine to share with people. They could check it out. They can be, give me the thumbs up and go, cool, merge it. That's, that's, that's us. At the very least, they do have to log in because this oh. is, <laughs> right, this is an authenticated view. So they have to at least log into Ambassador Cloud so that you can see which users clicked on this link, right? So, so, so that there is, there's some, it's not just a public, uh, uh, a URL where anyone in the world can click it, you have to at least authenticate to Ambassador Cloud. Uh, okay. I mean, I'm, I'm going to test that, but <laughs> I, 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 I don't trust you. That's, that's all I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So if I go to it and I say, okay, you have to log in, you got to be authentic. That's a really cool feature as well. Um, there's lots to love here. This is really cool. All right, let's see. What's next? What more magic am I getting today? Uh, so yeah, we've Browse to that, we saw the green, we've seen the orange on the preview environment, what's next? So we've got collaborating, outbound sessions, and then the FAQ. Cool. What should we, what should I click on next? <laughs> if I, yeah, I, so, so, so there's definitely like, like quite a few other features that Telepresence have, like Intercept is the, the, the main, the main operating mode of Telepresence. Uh, uh, but if you click on uh, technical reference, I believe is where the the rest of the options are are located under, right? And so uh, one that we've recently we've recently we've recently released is the the Docker for intercepts. Uh, Daniel was talking about that earlier, but then there are also other other options here which can which can kind of uh, enhance your local development uh, experience by using using containers that have volume mounts. Or uh, you know, passing down environment variables from your cluster directly into uh, your locally running services. So there are quite a few different ways in which uh, you can enhance the intercept experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. We we can run through some of this this technical reference in a second. I, I just I'm going to come back to the demo we've just done for a second because it's just dawned on me that this is <laughs> completely different to every other tool that's trying to solve this challenge. <laughs> the ambassador has made this a networking problem rather than a file sync problem. Yeah. One of the things I see with all these dev tools is either they're doing a container build locally, pushing it to a registry, pulling it in the cluster, and then doing a port forward, or they're literally syncing the entire file system locally into something inside of the cluster and trying to handle it this way. Th this seems really different and in a really, really good way in that you've just went, no, let's work locally. And we'll do all the traffic magic. And it definitely is traffic magic. There's no doubt. <laughs> I mean, this isn't real. Um, I think that's really, really interesting. I don't know why that hadn't clicked in my head before this session, but I don't think anyone else is solving it in this way. And now I understand why we have a Java engineer and a network engineer on our call <laughs> as we dissect the problem of what Telepresence is doing. It's like, this is a networking approach to a challenge that has been solved a multitude of other ways. But this one just seems to work better in my very limited experience. Super interesting you noticed that, um, though, because that, that's like, a great inference, because Peter and I are big fans of Scaffold. So we use Scaffold quite a lot, which is a Google tool for basically automating the build of containers behind the scenes. So you, <clears throat> we talked earlier about fidelity. There's some argument that if you're using Scaffold, syncing up either file system or, or more correctly, if you're using Scaffold to automate the building of the container and pushing up. So you're coding away, you hit build, Scaffold magically uh, pushes your container up behind the scenes then what you're testing against in the cluster is exactly what you're going to deploy or very close to it because it's built in a container mm -hmm. the one thing with telepresence is you actually are running it typically outside of a container locally does that make sense so that that's like in terms of i've had a few folks say oh fidelity wise scaffold gives me that higher fidelity and it's like totally get it but telepresence is that gives you a faster dev loop 
And then right at the end, you can use scaffold. So Peter and I will often say that. It's not an either or, right? You can use telepresence super fast DevLoop. Then you can have scaffold in the background uploading to, to an actual container to give you that super high fidelity. Mm. So all these tools plug together, but you are spot on in terms of the file system approach uh, and all the container approach versus the networking approach. Yeah, I think that feedback loop is what's so important here. You know, again, yeah. I do a lot of Rust. Like if I'm working on my Rust application, I'm doing compilations and runs locally, or maybe there is some level of hot reloading and getting that really quick feedback loop, even without running it in Kubernetes, which is nice. But then because it's a compiled application that runs on a Docker container, you, yeah, at the end, I can see why I'd want to say, okay, use tell it or scaffold or something that's going to do the build, deploy it, and then make sure that everything still works the way I want it to work. So it's not either or, it's mm. find what works right for you and, and leverage it. That's really cool. Wow. I mean, I never like networking stuff, but today I think it's, <laughs> it's, it's definitely changing for me. I'm starting to appreciate networking a lot more. Um, we have a, a question. Yeah. Sorry, I need to go up here. Mm -hmm. I would say, yeah. And, and like, like there's a lot of times when you are working on that local service where you just have the external external dependencies where like most of the time it's like a database or something where you just need to connect to it and that's exposed via service and you just want access to that stuff, right? Without creating all the network tunnels yourself. And so just doing like a simple telepresence connect and then allowing your local service to connect to those things just makes even those processes just so much faster and so much more seamless. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, we, we got a question from Russell in the chat. Uh, is the login for the preview environment a required feature if I'm using my own cluster? What's the situation there? Yeah, that's a that's a good question there. Can we can we answer that? So the ambassador cloud login is a requirement for to do the collaboration features where you want to create the preview URL or you want to do selective intercepts, uh, which is which is it's also a requirement if you want to use our demo clusters, but for separate reasons, right? Like we, we, we giving a demo cluster, right? We need to at least know who you are and who's receiving <laughs> it so that we have some level of tracking. And so that's kind of the requirement there. But for the, the segregated uh, traffic uh, intercepts, those ones, uh, we, you also want to see who, where the traffic is going to, who's actually viewing the preview URLs, and it gives it much more organization uh, to understand how that whole process is working. But you can use the default intercept all traffic without having to log into Ambassador Cloud. And I do know some, some users really prefer this when they're just working by themselves early on in the process. And so just like, oh, it's just my local cluster and I'm just wanting to intercept traffic for myself. And then at some point later down the development cycle, then they'll be like, okay, now I'm ready to start sharing things. And then they can log in and do those uh, intercepts based on header routing. Okay, I just want to make sure I understood that correctly. So if I'm using my own Kubernetes clusters and I wanted to preview environments, um, I would still need the Ambassador Cloud account and my team would have to be there too. Um, okay. Correct, yes. Mm -hmm. But if it's I worth, don't... Um, sorry, on you go. <laughs> oh, sorry, David. Is it worth... Actually, if you did a, a kubectl um, get pods uh, uh, all, which would just be easier, <clears throat> we can show you. How's this one there? pops up. You actually notice in the data processing service, there's two containers. And one of those is a sidecar. <clears throat> it's actually an Envoy proxy doing the routing under the hood. And when you log in, we swap the sort of the basic proxy, which routes everything with a smart proxy. So that's kind of the, the, the actual like technical details there. As soon as you do telepresence login, that, pod, that um, container gets swapped out. And then you can route based on headers and other things. OK. Can, can we just kind of be clear about like, can, can I do all of this stuff with the Ambassador Cloud login and my own Kubernetes cluster for free? Or is this where the paying option comes in? Like, wh where's the line here? Shall I take on the so the... is... oh, <laughs> Sorry, the delay. Sorry. Yeah, I think the, the line currently is at five managed services for, for telepresence. So, okay. so up to that point, it is free. Okay, so people can get started then and start using all of these really cool features early on and playing, kicking the tires. And then once they're as impressed as I am, start giving you a little bit of money back. So that, that's right, and you, can use the, and you can use the intercept all feature all you want, right? Yeah. That's yeah. because that's unauthenticated. And so that's our open source product. And you can use that uh, without any limitations. 
Mm-hmm. So everything until you do the telepresence login, David, like, you know, go nuts. You can like do as many things as you like there, but as soon as you do telepresence login, then yeah, the five services gets, kicks in. Yeah. Yeah, I think that makes sense. You know, if teams want to be able to do preview environments like that, I think you're solving a real problem there. So that makes yeah. a lot of sense. And it's, it's worth noting is there's two problems we solve. There's one is the private kind of mode, like you personal intercepts, we call them, as in just you carve out your little bit of the cluster. Because you asked earlier on, David, can we both be intercepting services, the same service? Mm-hmm. The answer is yes. And like you, I could be coding, you could be coding, and we're not, as long as we're not mutating state in the cluster we're going to be kind of isolated, right? Um, but then there's also what Peter was talking about, the shared intercept. So Peter and I could be pairing, particularly as you mentioned in that remote context, I can share the preview URL, Peter can see exactly what I'm doing, and we can get that super fast loop going on. So it's kind of the personal intercept versus the shareable intercept as well. Awesome. Okay, so let's cover a couple of more things and then we'll kind of wrap up our session for today. Uh, we've got the technical reference here, which you said I should just pop open. Uh, what should we take a look at? What, what what explains more of the magic? I guess what explains uh, <laughs> the magic, <laughs> right? Like if you if you click on uh, DNS resolution, like, like I think this is where a lot of the magic happens, right? And yeah. and right, we're we're resolving a lot of stuff based on on namespaces and what intercept you're using, and if you are now intercepting something in the a namespace A, right? Like, like gives you access to everything in that namespace without having to to list it, list out uh, specifically the whole uh, service dot namespace. It allows you to just use those service names, and right, that gives you much more a much closer uh, connection to what that uh, experience is if you actually are in the cluster and something is living in that namespace. So the telepresence list command does that. That just lists all of the intercepts. That lists all the available uh, services to intercept in the the namespace that you're in, and it also it also shows if one of those is already being intercepted, then it'll show uh, that intercepts information. Uh, okay, cool. And you mentioned the the Docker intercepts as well. Mm-hmm. Um. So... Yeah. Sorry, on you go. <laughs> Yeah, so this is a really cool one. Uh, I think Daniel mentioned this earlier, and so essentially what this does is this this will take a local an image that you have locally, and when you start the intercept, it will start that image as a container locally on your machine and route the traffic directly into that container. Uh. So one of the use cases I've done is I I was um, working on a Spree app as a Ruby framework and the gems were just like super old. It was an old version of Ruby. Sure, I could have used RBM, for example, to run different versions of Ruby. I could have done some probably clever things with gems, but by just running that application in a Docker container, I could do with my gem installs and gem bundles in that container, not pollute my local file system. And then I just routed my service to that container. So it's kind of like, you know, encapsulating the dev environment. And because the, the the cool feature with volume mounts is I can even mount my code into that container, right? So I can be coding in VS Code on my local machine, mounting the results into the container, getting hot reload, because Spree supports hot reload. But that hot reload, I can be hitting from my ingress, my actual remote ingress. OK. That was, there's a lot of <laughs> concepts there. That, I, I, <laughs> does that make sense, David? <laughs> it does make sense, yeah. I was just trying to. You know, keep a hold of all the different strings. Yeah, there's, sorry, there's so as I was talking, there. I was thinking there was a lot, a lot of concepts there. But essentially, like particularly for Python or, or Ruby, think of RBM, think of virtual env. Um, you know, the beauty of, of doing a build, even without telepresence, within a container, like folks often doing multi-stage builds, yeah. is you don't pollute your local um, machine with all the different gem files and so forth, or all the Python equivalents. So the, the beauty of doing it with telepresence, you just say, hey, intercept, but don't write it to my local host, whatever, write it to my Docker container I'm spinning up as part of this command. I mean, it, it just gives me so much more questions. Like, <laughs> so everything in the Docker container can speak to my Kubernetes cluster. Yeah, that's it. It's pretty awesome, right? Because <laughs> my, spree, my spree app was calling out to a MySQL database running in the cluster. It was calling out to another microservice running in the cluster. Yeah, and I was coding in VS Code, doing my code, hit and save. How cool is that, right? <laughs> I, I mean, even if I tried to understand a little bit of how it was working on my native host, I, I'm really confused at how it even works in a container because it's going through a bridge network. I'm assuming 
it doesn't matter which Docker network it's on. Does it have to be on the bridge? What if it was in a composed network? Like, does, does any of that matter, or does it just work? So, so no, telepresence is actually yeah, yeah. Is, <laughs> telepresence is actually creating the container for you. So, right. so all of those, all of those features are, are like the networking features and stuff are actually mm -hmm. hidden away from the user. Um, and so, so you don't actually have to think about it. Telepresence is just looking for that image that you have locally, and it's going to start it uh, with all the proper network connections. Okay, that helps because I thought you were magically changing something within my containers that were already running, and I was like, "What?" So, okay, you you actually uh, orchestrate the container for me. I just have to tell you. Yeah. That. Okay. At this point, can we shout out Thomas, Luke, Donny, the amazing engineers that do the work at Bastel Labs? Obviously, open source project. <laughs> Lots of folks contribute. They're fantastic. But like in particular, some of the networking stuff, like you know, wow, it's amazing that the team would do. So yeah, Thomas, Luke, Donny, massive hat tip. Yeah, I'm gonna to have to read some more networking books. <laughs> Okay. Um, is there anything else we should cover before we finish up for today? Is there anything that we haven't talked about showing off? Anything you want to make sure people are familiar with? The one final thing I was going to mention, Peter, is the environment variables. I know you and I use that quite a bit. So um, definitely worth like it's, uh, some folks if you're using that 12 factor style and um, you bake things into your environment variables. So we can export them to a, a file, either a M file format or a JSON file format. So when I'm using IntelliJ, there's a env-file plugin. So I can export all my environment variables from the remote cluster, the, the pod I'm running in, uh, to a file and load that file into IntelliJ so that when my app spins up and it looks for the um, Ms, it will find them because the plugin joins together the, the file I've exported. So we find the, the two ones that the two things that people often migrate to pretty quick in the IntelliPresence journey is the environment variables and the volume mounts. Ah, I hadn't thought of that. And now that you do, it seems silly that I didn't. Yeah. Like, of course, we want to build one container image to run in all of our environments. We use a multitude of environment variables to configure where the databases are, where the services are. Some people go by convention, but I think it's more common just to have an environment variable. So we can actually expose those from the remote pod to our local environment. Too. Exactly that, David. Yeah, both like I've got um, a walkthrough on Tele uh, IntelliJ, and Peter's got a walkthrough for VS Code. So whatever you're using, and we can, and if you're using just a shell, we can do that as well. So that's super useful, being able to export your environment variables locally. All right. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll throw one more thing out, and, and then Peter, if you have anything, we can tackle that too. But I see R back here, and I'm scared to click on it, but also curious to click on it. <laughs> Go for it. Is this going to mean? Does this mean that if my pod has access to a service account in my cluster, we're going to make that work locally, or am I, is my guess wildly well, inaccurate? This R back is actually uh, when you do the telepresence connect. Remember, it's going to create that traffic manager for you if it doesn't exist. So there are some levels of permission that telepresence is expecting, and so like for, especially for larger teams. Uh, some some developers don't exactly have full admin rights to the cluster to create those namespaces, to create the traffic manager. So you have to pre-deploy uh, the telepresence infrastructure. And this kind of walks you through uh, what is the bare minimum RBAC procedure that you would need in order to use telepresence. Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Is there anything that you want to look at before we finish up here? Is there anything we've missed? I, I think we I think we covered uh, pretty much everything. I think this was a the good walkthrough. Well, I mean, well like one thing I just sort of snuck into the docs. I think it's brand new, Peter. I think you and I were talking to Casey about it. Is telepresence in LinkedIn? I, I think that's like that's half the presses folks are seeing that. So we have a lot of requests of folks using telepresence with LinkedIn and Istio and Console. And Nick Jackson from HashiCorp very did a very kind demo for us in our Ambassador Fest a couple of weeks ago. I know Casey on the team is working on the LinkedIn integration and Istio. Is supported as well, even with MTLS. So the doc's coming oh, soon. Wow. So half the press is just spotted that as you were navigating, David. Awesome. Very, very cool as well. There's just, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, it's rare that I'm borderline speechless with some of these demos. And I've got to say, there's just, there's, there really is a lot to love about the way that this just enables me, it, that kind of hands off approach to how I want to develop my application. Like you're not enforcing me to adopt any real standards or tools you're just saying work how you normally work using node ruby python whatever we'll handle the traffic a bit and then things just work and i think that kind of hands-off approach just will resonate with a lot of people and i think that if you're not checking out telepresence yet people should and this is almost turned into a shell which i feel really bad about but again it's rare that i am that impressed with a tool on this show so thank you for Appreciate just it. coming on and sharing that with us it's very very cool 
No, thank you. Uh, is there anything? Yeah, you thanks like for having to... us. <laughs> is there anything you want to share before we finish up, or will I just cut you off now? Like, what do you want? <laughs> <laughs> we'll do a shameless plug for like Peter does amazing onboarding sessions, office hours as well. So pop along to get Ambassador website, join us on our Slack. Um, you can reach out to both of us. We're both uh, there. Cindy's does amazing work managing the community as well. So we love to connect with folks. We love to hear gnarly problems because as you hinted at, David, the networking stuff is far from simple, right? So Peter's often debugging these kind of things. Um, get involved. We're spinning up a summer of Kubernetes, uh, some uh, training or some resources of folks that want to learn if they're brand new to Kubernetes. So pop along to Slack and uh, we'll be giving uh, some more information on that in, a, I think, next week, end of this week, next week. So we, we basically love just chatting. We really appreciate the invite there. We just love connecting with folks. Like half the thing with Kubernetes is just figuring out all the tools out there, right? So many <laughs> awesome tools that we, you know, we'd love you to look at our tools, but like equally scaffold other tools out there that help out. We're happy to share our thoughts on those as well. Yeah, there are so many tools in the cloud native landscape. And to the point, I'll never run out of episodes. So it's always a pleasure <laughs> to be able to play and experiment with them. All right. Well, again, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been an absolute pleasure taking a look at Telepresence. I'm really excited to try it out and play with it in my own time. Uh, I'm sure if I have any problems, you'll be more than happy to help me, I hope. Uh, <laughs> anyone else, uh, reach out to people on Twitter, leave questions in the comments. I will do my best to forward them on to Peter and Daniel as required. Uh, thank you again. Have a wonderful day and I will speak to you both soon. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Cool. Thanks, Thanks, David. David. Thanks, David.